All right, we are back. We are back. So uh, again, I'm very excited. I'm very excited for what is happening and what is coming. All right. Um, I'm really excited to dedicate the kitchen. It's been it's been quite a journey, an exciting journey. All right. So uh, let us get ready to hear God's word. I'm going to continue my message today on vision. We are talking about vision. Last week I talked about giving birth to a vision. Today I'm going to talk about the power of a vision, the power of a vision. And we saw the life of Nehemiah, how the vision changed his life. And um, he was not the same man he was anymore. He was just a cupbearer. Uh, he became a man that uh, built a wall around Jerusalem, a master builder, a master motivator, a master leader uh, in his day who did great things for God. And uh, it also not only changed uh, Jerusalem's condition, it also changed his own life. The Bible says, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, Nehemiah, as soon as he heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who kept covenant, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. You know, uh, Nehemiah's worldview had changed at that point once he gave a, a birth to a vision. He saw God in a different way. He saw God as a God of heaven. He did not see God as a God of circumstances. He saw God beyond the waves that he faced in his life, beyond anything that he could ever face. And, and he worships this God, and he stands before God. He sat before God. He wept before God. He mourned for days. He fasted and prayed because he saw that God was the way that something great can be done in a city. You and I can, uh, can do things with our own ability. There is so much you can do with our own ability. But when God gets involved, that human ability becomes just a small portion of what can be accomplished because God can do great things. Amen? He can take uh, five loaves of bread and two fish and he can multiply it and feed a, a multitude. That is who, uh, what happens when God comes part of the equation. So, so Nehemiah's life changed. The power to change his life is, is happening due to the vision that God gave him. So friends, I want to talk about the power of vision. Amen? But before I talk about the power of vision and what the ingredients of vision is and, and uh, see uh, how vision is developed, I really want to talk about what vision is not. Sometimes we don't understand vision properly, and uh, so I want to talk about what vision is not. The best way to talk about what something is, is to talk about what it is not, okay? So I'm going to talk about what it is not, and I'm going to give you a lot of uh, uh, words that start with the letter P, okay? And it just worked out that way. All right. Vision is not perception. Vision is not perception. So if you're at home, I want you to say this. Vision is not perception. Now, perception is important, you know? We want to make sure that we see things properly as it is, because if you don't see things properly, if you don't have a clear mind, and if you uh, misinterpret things, you're going to do things the wrong way. So perception is important, but perception only um, shows you what is happening, what is the reality of things. Perception cannot take you beyond that, you know, but vision takes you beyond even perception. It can take you into the realm of the impossible. It can take you into the realm of the future. You know, perception is telling you what is happening right now. You know, we talked about Peter. Peter was able to see what is happening right now. But, uh, but perception, uh, but vision takes you a step forward. It takes you a step beyond the things that are happening right now. Hallelujah. You know, somebody was telling me, you know, uh, looking at the, uh, the condition of things, the way things are going, I might even leave this country. And I thought to myself, you know, I actually said to him, this is not the time to leave the country. This is the time to build. This is the time to invest. This is the time to buy. This is the time to do great things. This is not the time to disengage. When, when things get rough, when things get tougher, that's the time to give birth to a vision. 
That is the time to start new things. That is the time to believe in great things. That is the time for us to say, you know, my God can do great and mighty things. You know, you did not need a vision to build a wall if there was a wall already. You do not need a vision to build a church building if there was a church building already. You don't need a vision when things are going great. You need a vision when things are going bad. Hallelujah. So vision is not based on perception. It's not based on what you see around you. You know, if you talk, uh, talk to uh, big uh, um, investors, what do they say? They say the best time to buy is when everybody else is afraid. The best time to buy is when, the, when everybody is selling. Buy, you know, buy low and sell high is what they teach you. They understand something about the markets. They understand something that when everybody is scared, when everybody is, is flustered, when everybody is uh, disengaging, that's the time for you to engage. You know, and that works out well for them. What about in our spiritual life? What about in giving birth to a godly vision? What about using God's vision for our time? Now is precisely the time to have a vision in our life. Now is precisely the time to have a vision for ministry. Now is precisely the time to have a, min a vision to build big and build great and do great things in our community, in our society, because our God is not just a God of a local neighborhood. Our God is a God of heaven, and he can do great and mighty things. Can I hear an amen? All right, so vision is not perception. Vision is also not pessimism. You know, pessimistic people will always say it cannot be done. You tell them, hey, I want to do this, they'll say, it cannot be done. You know, um, there, was a, uh, there was a prophet in the Old Testament, his name is Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah is called the prophet of doom and gloom, you know, because he always talked about the Babylonians are coming, they're going to come and destroy Jerusalem and stuff like that. And people call him the prophet of doom and gloom, and some people call him the prophet, the weeping prophet the weeping prophet, and he cried all the time for his people, and people sometimes put him down. I've heard pastors say, I don't want to be like Jeremiah, because Jeremiah was a prophet of doom. But guess what, friends? Even Jeremiah, whom people label as a prophet of doom, spoke great words of hope, because he knew God. He knew people, but beyond that, he knew God. He knew what God can do, and it is Jeremiah who said in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, he speaks the word of God. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Who's talking? Jeremiah. What is the circumstance? The Babylonians are going to invade Jerusalem and destroy. And, and this is exactly what Jeremiah is prophesying again and again and again. He's saying Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. <laughs> it is a hopeless situation. He's weeping for his people. But Jeremiah said there is a time of restoration coming. And he says, God knows the plans for your life, a plan to prosper you despite you. So Jeremiah was a very hopeful person. He was not a man of doom and gloom. He was a hopeful person. He had a vision for the future. He knew that God was doing something greater than what these Jewish people understood. And I believe today that God is doing something greater than even Christians understand what he's doing. God has a plan, a plan for our welfare. God is not planning our evil. And God has a plan to uh, to give you a future and a hope. Do you believe that this morning? I hope you're not a, a person that sees the cup half empty, but you see the cup half full. Amen. There is some more work to be done, friends. There is a revival coming. There's more people that needs to be saved. There's more people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's more children that need to walk to the uh, front of the altar and say, I believe in Jesus and, and, and go and get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe those days are still yet to come. Greater things are yet to come. So vision can never be based on pessimism. Have you ever tried to tell people, you know, uh, I think God is going to do this, and they say it cannot be done? 
I remember I was in Ottawa and, uh, and, uh, I, and God called me to Quebec and the first thing that people said is like, Quebec, graveyard of pastors, you know? You're not going to succeed in Quebec. But praise God, with God, all things are possible. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. So friends, uh, vision is not perception. Vision is not based on pessimism. And vision can never be premature. Vision can never be premature. What am I talking about? You know, God gave Joseph a vision. You know, God gave Joseph a vision. And guess what Joseph did? He ran to his brothers and he said, Hey guys, I have a vision. I have a vision. You know what? You all are going to uh, uh, bow down prostrate before me. Bow before me and honor me. Now, how did the brothers take it? They liked his vision so much, they took him and put him in a pit. And that's when his real life started. You know, after that, from pit, he prayed, God, take me out of the pit. And God put him in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in prison, you know, and uh, in bondage. And then from bondage, he said, God, take me out of bondage. And he went into prison. And then from there, he prayed, God, take me out of here. And then he went to the palace. So pit to palace. But before he could go to the palace, he had to go through all those processes in his life. Before God can make the vision fruitful in your hand, God should make you fruitful first. God needs to change you first. He has to change your motives, has to change the person you are. And, and, and Joseph went from an immature young teenager who thought he could do whatever to a person who was composed, who knew how to manage his emotions. He knew how to control uh, and understand who's a crook and who's not a crook before God can use him in the, in the palace. So vision can never be premature. I had a vision to be a pastor when I was 13 years old. I knew I was going to be a pastor. But I was telling you about my first sermon that I preached in 1991. Uh, if I look at it, it's so embarrassing, even to this day, because I was not ready, half baked, half cooked. And, uh, but that's, I had to go through the process. I had to learn to step out by faith and, and do what I knew how, uh, how to do. And uh, little by little, God built me. There was disappointments, there were setbacks, there was going forward, there was going backwards, and unexpected, uh, uh, situations that came to our, to our lives and unmet expectations and, and discouragement and disappointment. Through it all, through it all, we saw that God is faithful. So vision can never be premature. You know, imagine God gave Nehemiah a vision and Nehemiah says, hey, this is pretty cool. I have a vision now. So he jumps out of his window and he sneaks out of uh, uh, the king's palace and he goes to Jerusalem and he says, here I am, I have a vision. Nobody would have listened to him. But see, Nehemiah had to go through a process. He had to go and speak to the king, deal with that issue. Sometimes we have to deal with the issues of our life. He had to deal with his his employment contract. He had to deal with that, take care of that situation. And after that, he took care of that situation. He, he goes with the letter and he, he goes with the provisions that are needed to fulfill the vision. Every vision needs provision. Amen? Every vision needs provision. I just made it up, okay? Another P. There you go. Every vision needs a provision. So, so vision cannot be premature. You have to work through the process in order to let God do what he wants to do. So three things I've talked about. What is vision not? Vision is uh, not what? Perception. Vision is not pessimism. And vision is not premature. God may take you through a process. Be ready be ready. Don't give your name for children's ministry and say, God, use me mightily in, the, in children's ministry and, and come back to us the two weeks later and say, God, uh, Pastor, please take my name out. I didn't expect so many problems. You are going to get problems, but you persevere through that because it is a vision that came from God. You did not give your name because Pastor uh, put a guilt trip on you. You gave a name because there was a passion that rose up within you. And you wanted to see children saved. You wanted to see children know about Jesus. And that's why you gave your name. And if you give your name for that right reason, you will never be put off. 
by any problems. So what vision is not? And let me tell you what vision is not for. I told you what vision is not. Now let me tell you what vision is not for. And you know my stand and my position on these things, but I, I want to repeat it anyway. What vision is not for? Vision is not for, for praise. The people can praise you. People can say, what a great, talented singer you are. What a great, talented preacher you are. What a great, talented teacher you are. You know, God does not give a vision in your life so that people can appreciate you and praise you and, and glorify you. It is not for that. It is so people can appreciate and praise and glorify God. I mean, worldly vision can be like that. Worldly vision, you know, some, somebody wants to become a CEO of a large company. People come and say, what a great CEO he is. You know, that's great. But when you are talking about godly vision, it's not for you to be praised. It's not for you to be noticed. It's not for you to uh, be the center of focus. It is for Jesus to be the center of focus. Even when you give, Jesus taught us this way. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3, he said, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Satan said to Jesus, jump from this high place so everybody can see you and worship you. Jesus said, no, I'm not doing that. If Jesus would not do that, then you and I should not, never do anything for the praise of people, for the appreciation of people, for the affirmation of people. Our affirmation comes from God. So don't do anything for praise. And, and, and you know, in the Bible, you'll see that the brothers of Jesus said to Jesus, Jesus, if you want to be a great prophet, if you want to be recognized, go and do the ministry and your miracles in front of people. Jesus said, my time has not come. Why? Because if Jesus would not take a position of being appreciated and praised, why should we? He said, when you go to a wedding, make sure you sit in the back. Let them call you to come and sit in the front. Don't go be the one who sits in the front and then the, and the host of the, of the uh, wedding ceremony comes to you and says, I, I want you to go sit in the back. We don't do anything for praise, my friends. We don't do anything for others' appreciation. We don't do anything for fame because that's one of the snares of the devil. Another thing, let me tell you, uh, don't... Uh, have a godly way. God never gives you godly vision for profit. For profit. Sometimes you may get paid. You know, I, I had a vision to become a pastor. I got paid. But never for profit. You never do ministry for profit. Never do ministry for profit. If there's a young man or a young woman listening to me and you, God is calling you into ministry, you know, understand that God will never call you into, give you this godly vision so that you can profit from it. How can I exploit people? How can I sell my messages? If you're doing that, you fully don't understand the word of God. Freely you receive, freely you give is what the Bible says. Don't profit from ministry. Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 16, Nehemiah says, you know, I also persevere in the work on this wall. It was a difficult work. See, vision always comes with perseverance. There's another P there on this wall. And we acquired no land. And all my servants were gathered there for the work. And you keep reading the chapter, you'll see all the sacrifices that Nehemiah have made. And one of the things he's saying is, I did not buy any land. The land was cheap. I could have bought an entire neighborhood. I could have bought the entire place if I wanted to. I had the money, but I did not exploit people. I did not go and do all those things. That is not what I built this wall for, is so that I can benefit from it, so that I can, I can uh, retire from it. That's not the whole idea behind the vision that God has given me, friends. Friends, when God gives you a vision, Yes, he might give you the provisions for that vision, but it is never for you to, to profit from the vision. And I pray that God um, will, will cleanse our motives as we do ministry for him. Cleanse our motives as, 
as we do ministry for him. Nehemiah prayed, you know, God, I, I pray that even I and my fathers have, have sinned and I confess my sins and he, he prays to be cleansed from, his, from the sins of his past. He's not only confessing his own sins, he's confessing the sins of his people and his forefathers. We have all sinned. What did his forefathers do? They, they prophesied for a prophet. Five dollars for a small prophecy. Fifty dollars for a medium level prophecy. Five thousand dollars for an extremely detailed prophecy. <laughs> they had their own rates and each prophet charged their own rate and, and Nehemiah said, God, forgive us. He confessed his sins. He confessed the sins of his people. You know, friends, there are three kinds of con uh, cleansing that needs to happen in the lives of people. If God is calling you to ministry, three kinds of cleansing that needs to happen in your life. Number one is conduct. Conduct. Conduct is the easiest thing to, to, uh, to cleanse, you know. A little kid comes and, and uh, sits at church and he's shaking uh, his leg and he's running around and you say to him, hey, sit in one place. And he sits in one place. It's his conduct, his behavior. And that's easy to, uh, it's short term. It's easy to uh, make them behave, you know. Uh, you threaten them and they behave. <laughs> and uh, conduct, you can control people's conduct, you know. And uh, sometimes we, it's easy to cleanse our own conduct. Uh, we, can, we can fix those things. Maybe we can set an alarm, wake up in the morning. Instead of being lazy, we can become more active. We can fix our conduct. It's short term. And uh, there is another level to cleansing, and that's cleansing our character. Our character will take a little longer than that, you know, and that's why I believe in, uh, in when, I, when I'm training my children, I'm not just interested in controlling their conduct. I want to see them build character because character will take them wherever God takes them and they will still know how to behave because they have the character. So I can, I can control them. I can control their conduct. And they'll behave in front of me the moment they go to school, they're going to be a different person. They're going to be cursing, they're going to be cheating, they're going to be lying. But character takes some time. You need to engage, you need to work with that person a little bit before they develop that character. Once they develop that character, you can let them go anywhere. You know they will never misstep. Because God is cleansing their character. Give time for character to develop. You know, it takes time for character to develop. And there's another one, is core. God needs to cleanse our core of our being. And, and that is what I'm talking about today. The cleansing of the core of the being can take some time. I talk about motives. I talk about cleansing our motives. I talk about why we should do ministry. And people would be like, oh yeah, I get it, Pastor. I, I really get it. And you know, you go home and, and you forget and you continue doing ministry for the wrong reasons. You continue having the vision for the wrong reasons. And, and uh, see, God is now actually not just changing your character or your conduct. Now he's building your core. He's building the inside of you. And that might take you some time. And give people time. Give people time if you want them to change the core. And, and they will realize, hey, I've been doing ministry all my life and I've been doing it for the wrong reason. Give them time. Give them time. Ministry is not for praise. Ministry is not for profit. Ministry is not for pleasure. Ministry is not for pleasure. Somebody came to me one day and said, you know, vision, vision, <laughs> or I'm, I'm using them synonymously because when you have a vision, you'll end up doing some ministry. And... Um, and uh, somebody came to me and said, you know, I have this vision God has given me and, you know, and God is telling me that I need to have this kind of a car and I need to fly this kind of a plane and I need to have this kind of house and I need to have this kind of luxury. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness. And I said to this person, I don't think this is a vision from God. It's a vision, all right. But I don't think God gave it to you because God's vision does not come with promise of pleasure. In fact, Nehemiah, once a vision came to his life, he was living in pleasure. He was living in the king's palace. He had all the video games he could have played. He had Nintendo Wii or Xbox or whatever they play nowadays. 
all the latest gadgets, all the latest iPhone or, or, or cell phone or the, the latest chariot, the, the luxury model. He had it. He could use it. But now he left all that and he goes to a broken down, run down place called Jerusalem. It was a disaster. Jerusalem was a disaster during the days of Nehemiah. He didn't go there for pleasure. It's not like God called him to do ministry in Costa Rica or Puerto Rico. God called him to do ministry in, in, uh, in uh, the northernmost regions of Quebec where the weather is minus 40. We all have vision for the beach, but what about vision for, for the tundra? What is God speaking to you? I'm not saying God cannot use you there, you should not go there. What I'm saying is ministry is not for pleasure. Vision that God gives you is not for pleasure. It's never for pleasure. If somebody says to you um, that I deserve to have all these things, remind to them what Jesus did. Jesus said, Luke chapter 9, verse 58, and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds have, of the air have a nest but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus did not even have a place to lean against while he was on this earth. He said, you know, this fox is, he's, he's even talking about the fox. A fox has a hole that he could go crawl under and he can take some rest and the birds have a nest and they can be disengaged from everybody else. But Jesus says, I don't even have time to lean against something. He, was, he had no pleasure in that sense. Material pleasure is what I'm talking about. He had spiritual pleasure. Nehemiah says in Nehemiah 4.23, So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. See, there's this guy named Sanballat and Tobiah and a group of enemies that were working against the plan of God and and they were threatening the people of God. And one of the threats they said is, in the middle of the night, as you guys are working, we're going to come with our, with our army and we're going to destroy you guys. So, so the people now could not even take their clothes off. It's hot, but they could not take the clothes off. They had to have their clothes on. They had to keep their uh, weapon on their side and use their pitchfork or whatever else they were using for building. It was difficult work, no pleasure. Everybody was complaining, everybody was criticizing. Why this foolish work? Why should we build this wall? What's the point of this all? You know? But if you have a vision, it's gonna take you to uncomfortable places. It's gonna take you out of your comfort zone. Finally, let me, let me finish. What does vision contain? Vision contains some preparation work. You need to prepare for things. If God has given you a vision, you need to prepare. If God has given you a vision to get a great job, then you need to go write some exams. You need to go study. You, gotta, you wanna be a doctor, then you gotta finish your, your, your medicine. There's always things that you need to do. And, and the preparation part may not be a very easy part, but you still have to do it. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And I said to the king, If it pleases to the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, and let me pass through until I come to Judah. He, he's talking to the king, and he's making preparations for his journey. He says, I need some letters. I need some provisions. I need all these things before I can go do the job that I want to do. He's getting ready for it. And if God called you in a ministry, then go to Bible college. Oh, God can use me even if I don't go to Bible college. Yes, he can, but go to Bible college. Because by the time you, you actually start doing ministry, it's going to, uh, you might as well prepare. Preparation will set you up for success. Number one, preparation. Another thing I think you need is passion. Passion. 
When you have a passion to do something, you know, my wife came to me and she said, you know, I'm so happy because my passion was to build the kitchen for Dream Center and for the church. A passion to build the kitchen. And I said, I have no passion for the kitchen. I have passion to eat, but I have no passion to cook. I have no passion to build and, uh, and uh, ask people for money. I have no passion, friends, to ask you for money for the building. Uh, but we do that. We do that out of necessity. And you sort of build the passion. You sort of, because without passion, you cannot get anything done. You cannot get anything done. It's not like, you know, you wrote a plan, a five-year plan, and it just all works out. No, there's a, there's a process going through that. And there's work that happens. There's preparation that happens. And there are times when you feel like you want to give up, but the passion drives you forward and says, you can do it. Because that vision did not come from you. It came from God. How many of you have a passion for our children? You know, the, the greatest, saddest news in, in our Western churches is this, is that people still don't know how to communicate their faith to their children. They expect the pastor to do that. They expect the youth pastor to do that. They expect the church to do that. If your kids don't see you passionate about God, they're never going to be passionate about God. So do you have a passion for, for children that don't go to church anymore? You know, there's so many young people. I can introduce you to so many young people today in our own church that say, I wish I had a friend. I wish I had a mentor. I wish I had somebody to talk to. Because I cannot talk to the pastor all the time. He's busy. I wish I could talk to somebody and, and somebody to just appreciate me and guide me and teach me and, and, and mold me and show me the way to go forward. I wish I had somebody. I can tell you right now, introduce you to people like that. But if you don't have a passion for them, for them, you'll be useless. I'll have to remind you every two days, did you talk to so-and-so? Did you talk to so-and-so? Did you talk to so-and-so? It'll be more work for me to give that ministry to you than for me to do it myself because you don't have the passion to do that. I pray that as God's vision rises up within you, there's a passion for ministry. There's a passion to do God's work. There's a passion to see people saved. And I want to finish with this, which was the, really the title of my message. Vision has the power. The power of a vision is that it can change lives. It can change lives. Friends, you may think that the greatest, the greatest power of, of, uh, of vision is to build a building. That's nothing. You might think the greatest power of a vision is to build a kitchen. That's nothing. The greatest power of vision is to change the lives of people. Take people from drug addiction to a life of being set free. Take people from, from being hopeless into being hopeful. Take a young kid who cannot do his exams, who cannot write his do his homework and make him to be successful because you are mentoring into that person's life. Take a young man or a woman who, who has given up on ministry and you take them and you say, you can shine, you can do something great in the kingdom of God. You, know, you see, changing lives is greater than any vision that you can have. And that is the vision of my Lord Jesus Christ. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. You know, Peter was like shifting sand. But Jesus said, I'm going to take this Peter. And people like Peter, you know? People like Peter. It's not like God built the church on, on one man. It's like people like Peter who are weak and vulnerable. And God says, I'm going to take people like that and I'm going to invest in them. I'm going to show grace upon them. I'm going to give them my word and I'm going to show the devil that I can take losers and I can make them winners. That is a vision of Jesus. What is your vision this morning? I don't want you to be caught up with the waves that are 
going through our community that is passing through Canada, words of defeat, words of discouragement, words of giving up. I want you to have a vision because God's work is not done yet. Father God, I thank you for this day. As we get ready to go for the dedication of our kitchen, I pray that you be with us. I pray that young adults and youth, as we start this coming Friday, I pray that you give them a new vision. Bless the, bless the new leader. We'll be introducing him to the church this coming week. And I pray, Lord, that you, you give them vision, passion, discipline to do God's work in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, I pray.